Nearly 50 years ago, Boston police officers stood guard outside of schools in Roxbury and South Boston as black and white students were bused to different city schools for the first time. The program, which was established to meet a federal court desegregation order, was met with overwhelming displays of racism, anger, and violence. It's clear whites who do not want blacks in their schools are acting in just the same way as violent whites in the South. I can remember it was an angry, angry time. No matter what we said, all these people that we looked up to at one time in our lives were turning against us. What you could feel was the palpable fear and animosity that, that just hung over the city, uh, like an explosion just waiting for a match to be lit. That day was just the beginning of a years-long fight with long-lasting impacts, all of which is covered in the new documentary from American Experience, The Bussing Battleground. I'm joined now by the film's directors and producers, Cindy Ray Dean and Sharon Grimberg, who also wrote the script for the documentary. Sharon, Cindy, thank you both for joining me today. Um, congratulations on the documentary, which thank will you. air tonight. I watched it last night. It was excellent. Um, and... Um, Sharon, I wanted to start with you and ask you about how this documentary came together. Um, what was the inspiration for starting this project? I have to say I wasn't particularly prescient. I, my son, who was 14 at the time, was assigned to read Common Ground, which was written by Anthony Lucas, Pulitzer Prize winning book about the desegregation schools in Boston. And I felt a little ashamed that having lived here for 25 years, I hadn't read the book. It's a very big story. I started to read it, and I... I suggested to Cameo George, who's the executive producer of American Experience, that it would be a good subject for a film, and she asked me to investigate and to look into it. And, and I did, and I realized that um, Lucas's book, which is a tour de force of research, is a particular story and leaves out a lot. Um, in, in particular, he, what he leaves out is the black activism that preceded the desegregation order. The, the black community had been um, fighting for 20 years, really, to, to achieve some kind of equity with the, with the white schools, that black schools were really failing um, and were very much inferior. Uh, so that was a piece of the story that's not really covered in Common Ground, and that was what I thought we could bring to the, the table by looking at at all of it, the complexity of race and class. And Cindy, um, you know, what excited you about the project when you heard about it? What was it about this particular story that told you, you, you know, you want to work on this? Yeah, um, Sharon invited me to come on and help tell the story. And the more she would tell me about the activism of Ruth Batson and other black Bostonians um, during this time period and their efforts to, you know, get school equity and, you know, get a decent education for their children um, really excited me. I mean, to me, I'd never heard of Ruth Batson. It was an untold story. And, you know, I was really happy to sign, sign on to yeah. tell it. Well, that was the first time I heard about her as well. So uh, uh, I think uh, you did a very nice job of that. Um, you know, one thing about uh, school busing in particular was that the politics of this, it was such a deeply unpopular uh, thing to do and, and so fraught. Um, obviously, the white parents here in Boston were very angry about it. They, you know, and a lot of white students were too. There were open displays of racism. At the same time, a lot was being asked of black parents who were putting their kids in danger, essentially, um, to bust them to these predominantly white schools. And I think we have a, a clip um, from the documentary that discusses the danger that black parents uh, had to put their children in and the decisions they made um, during, this, during this time. When I reported to Kevin White, on opening day that no black child had been killed. We thought that was a victory. It was the saddest day in Boston's history. But if a black child had been killed, there would have been a civil war. Black leaders had to make a tough decision to ask black parents to stay the course. Tough decision. All along the way, black parents have had to make very difficult decisions in order to assert their rights and to use their kids in the process. 
So in reporting out this documentary, uh, did you learn anything about, you know, the, the struggle for rights uh, when it came to black parents? Was this too big of a toll for them? Um, or, you know, did people think in the end it was worth it? Well, I think that um, what black parents primarily wanted was better education for their kids. And Ruth Batson and the NAACP felt that the only way to get that was to go into the white schools where they follow the money, that the white families would insist on a better education and so the kids should be in the same schools. I think that um, it, was, it was a lot to ask of children and in actually in February of uh, 1975, some 46 black organizations wrote a letter to the judge and said, Look, we would rather you prioritize quality over location. Please don't continue on this path. And the NAACP rightly said, this is the issue. This is the, the way the law is being broken is, is on, on, by segregating the schools. That is unconstitutional. That's the legal argument that we have. And so the, they proceeded down that route and continued, you know, refine the plan and, and, and bust the kids for a second and many more years to come. And Cindy, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, obviously a lot of people when they learn about civil rights in America, we hear stories about Selma, we hear stories about Montgomery bus boycotts. You know, why do you think the story of Boston um, is such a nationally resonant story? Um, well, I mean, it's very relevant today. I feel like, you know, what was happening in Boston um, in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s, I mean, the issues of school equity, um, parental rights, um, inclusive education, these are the issues that we're res wrestling with today. And for some reason, you know, across the country, people are having a hard time agreeing on, like, what those things mean and what's best you know, for kids. Um, these are the same issues that, you know, people in Boston were wrestling with. Um, so I, I, I know I find the story relevant, uh, extremely relevant yeah. today. Yeah, and we also have another clip that uh, describes what Boston was like in the years uh, before busing, um, you know, that sets the tone for, you know, why there might have been so much resistance uh, to the program. Boston had been a very white city. In the 1950s, you're seeing people come up from the deep south. They're crowding into these neighborhoods where blacks are allowed to live, the South End and Roxbury. They can't move out because of racial covenants written into the deeds. And outside of those black neighborhoods, they faced tremendous discrimination. Boston was like up south. There were patterns of racial discrimination everywhere. Black folks were invisible. It was like they didn't live in the city. The neighborhoods are their own little sort of worlds. People from South Boston didn't come into Roxbury. People from Roxbury didn't go into South Boston. So obviously since then, Boston has become much more diverse as a city. Um, at the same time, it's still pretty segregated, including the metro area more broadly, still very segregated. So Sharon, um, what lessons are there in this documentary for people, residents of Boston today? Um, what lessons from this documentary tell them about maybe how they can desegregate today? Um, well, I, I don't know how, I don't know that I could say that how how are we going to desegregate today? But I and I and I also want to say I didn't make this film to pour salt in old wounds. I think that um, a lot of what happened in the sixties and seventies um, happened because the communities were so distant from each other, and also uh, because there was a lot of distrust. I'm hoping that the film will allow people to step back and listen a little bit to the frustrations of both communities that um, uh, there's, the, the, the city's come such a long way since then in so many ways. There's so much more um, attention given to the education of children, which was really kind of a last thought and, and, and not really well attended to. So I'm really hoping that um, people can can learn from and listen, and we try to we try to we try to present a lot of different viewpoints in the film, and to to understand some of the frustrations in the white community as well as the great frustration and um, injustices that were being perpetrated on the on the black community. 
So, Cindy, I, I wanted to ask you, you just mentioned this earlier, um, but there are a lot of parallels with some of the issues that come up in this documentary and issues that are coming up in schools and school districts across the country today. Um, you know, notably, we're seeing in, in southern states and in Florida, we're seeing some efforts to, um, you know, change uh, the kind of history that's being taught, especially black history uh, that's being taught. Um, are there any parallels in specific that resonated with you in looking at this history 50 years ago, you know, particularly in looking at the character of the, the superintendent of the Boston schools who, you know, no Boston being maybe a northern liberal city at the time, spoke a lot in dog whistles that maybe we are more familiar with today. Did any of those parallels kind of strike you as, as, as interesting for understanding today's politics around schools? Yeah, I, I, yes, it did. You know, Louise Day Hicks was a master at talking in dog whistles. I'm playing to her base, you know. You know where I stand was her, her slogan. Um, and it was just a wink, wink, nod, nod. Yeah. You know, I'm against, you know, um, putting black kids in schools with, right. you know, my, 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 my white constituents. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. You, you vote for me, you're safe. Yeah. Um, and I feel like today there's still dog whistles. Um, you know, depending on where you sit politically, I think some of the things around parental rights is in some ways could be a dog whistle if it means that you don't want to teach, you know, black history or if you don't want to teach a history of people who perhaps have different lifestyles. I mean, some of these things um, are also treated in ways that, um, I guess, whip people up um, into a frenzy instead of talking about education as a way to involve all kinds of people. Right. Um, to be very inclusive in how we teach. Right. So to close this out, I have a question for both of you. Um, you know, Obviously, you spent a lot of time on this topic. Um, it's a very uh, rich history here in Boston. You know, in, in putting this together, um, were you sur what, 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 was, what was something that surprised you about Boston or surprised you about this desegregation effort here? Was there anything there that stood out to either of you that was, you know, something new that you may have not considered before when thinking about the civil rights struggle um, in the U.S.? Sharon, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, I didn't had no idea that there was such a long struggle here in Boston for the school, um, around school equity. I had no idea about that. Um, I think that one of the things that really struck me is how little the school committee cared about education, actually. Uh, they spent very little on the schools. I think $275 on elementary school kid per year, which is $3,000 a day, tiny, tiny amount of money. Uh, they, they, they spent most of the time worrying about where they were signing teachers, who was getting, to, who was going to get promoted. A lot of time was spent by teachers contributing to school committee members. So there's a lot of graft and corruption and, and very little focus on, on teaching the kids. Cindy, we have about 15 seconds. Did anything stand out to you um, from this documentary? Um, from working on this film, I think what surprised me is just how um, alive this history is still today for the people who lived through it, either lived through um, the years coming up to desegregation and those past it, yeah. and how people remember that time, whether it's you know in anger or hopeful or maybe you're regretful, right. and I think that people are still sort of um, wrestling yeah. um, with that time and what it meant. Yeah, well, that's a great note to end on. Cindy, Sharon, thank you both for joining me today, and congratulations on the documentary. Thank, thank you. you.